Sarah Obadwe here from Horse Racing Nation, pleased to be joined by Keith Bush for the first time, who has uh, kind of given uh, given a little rise to fame on Twitter yourself with your dive into uh, horse racing handicapping and data analysis. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and your um, sort of interest in horse racing so far? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm a computer scientist by training. Um, and I've always done research in uh, machine learning and predictive modeling. And my uh, how I got into horse racing essentially was during COVID. Um, during the lockdown, I was looking for a hobby to do from my living room. And uh, I'd always had horse racing in the back of my mind as something I thought was interesting, but I'd never really done it. I'd been to Oakland. I'm from Little Rock. I live in Little Rock currently. Um, and I'd been to Oakland a few times for the big derby days. I'd been to Santa Anita uh, visiting a friend in California once, so I was always interested in it. And then I just decided one day during uh, right before the Breeders' Cup in 2020, I went on Amazon and and uh, bought all the books, the Davidovitz book and the Brohammer book and buyer, uh, you know, the buyer series and whatnot. And I just read them and started coding, uh, looking around for data, found data sets I could use, and started predicting from there. And Never look back. It's been really exciting. It's been just the greatest hobby. I, I wish I would have started earlier. <laughs> That's really cool. I feel like a lot of people have sort of found um, renewed interest in different things during COVID since it gave us all a little bit more free time to have something that we wanted to pursue. And I love that horse racing was that thing for you. And can you tell me a little bit about any major successes you've had or anything that's been like really eye-opening that you've learned about so far? Uh. The major success, so this summer, um, the computer modeling that I'm doing, I actually did a live test of it over several months and kind of tweeted about it on my account, uh, where it was showing over several hundred bets, 25% uh, ROI. And that was the first time I'd really, the, the model was really working the way that theoretically it should work based on kind of my internal analysis of its performance. So that was really satisfying to know it's, it's possible that this can be done. Um, can it be scaled to you know many years of, of successful <laughs> positive ROI bets? That's yet to be uh, seen. Um, kind of the highlight since I've been on horse racing was really I, I wrote um, a, a tweet about uh, the success of David Aragona being the morning line maker in Naira, and that really kind of launched um, me into a conversation with people, like kind of professionals in the community, uh, allowing me to kind of talk to people, um, learn more about you know kind of behind the scenes work that goes on in horse racing. Um, that tweet kind of started everything for me. And David, obviously one of the best, someone that I've had the privilege of meeting and having a couple of conversations with. And it's really, um, I think, very validating in a way to kind of see all the things that like I sort of believe are true and sort of recognize trends for without getting the numbers behind it just from following this game on a day-to-day -day basis and getting to talk to professionals within the industry as well as people that are excellent handicappers just in their spare time on Twitter. So to see the actual numbers behind it that you're analyzing and kind of uh, proving all of those things to be true or maybe disproving some of those things and wanting me to take a second look at them. I think that that's a really interesting approach to have the the numbers to back it up and the data behind it, which of course is something that you need to prove any opinion going forwards. Um, and for you, you've also started this kind of side project with Capper Track. Can you tell me a little bit about what inspired that and what it is that you're looking for with that? Yeah. The, um, so I'm really interested in kind of understanding the game in all its aspects and really trying to beat the game from a long-term ROI perspective. That's It's a very hard goal. It's, you know, almost unachievable probably. But, uh, you know, my background is in science and training. And so I I think of ways like I test the environment, like how can I achieve more success? And one thing I've seen is that there are some very, very smart public handicappers. They make really good points uh, and they find big prices. And that's one of the things my model does not do well is it does not find big priced horses typically when I'm making bets. It really kind of grinds out margins on uh, the chalkier horses. And so I'm trying to understand how with Capper Track, I'm, I'm basically measuring the performance of public handicappers, a set of really kind of nationally prominent handicappers, and to see if I can understand trends from their work. Seeing, you know, do public handicappers, you know, pick long shots? Some of them do, some of them don't. Um, definitively put numbers to that, 
and then try to understand what spots are they, they picking those horses. If I can glean how to inform in my own model, um, how to find that part of the space where those, you know, there's positive EV, but there's also uh, that tend to come in, you know, at a higher rate than you'd expect. And that work really, that question was informed by that interest, but also from um, a lot of science that's gone into forecasting showing that humans and computers work better together. So computers are good at crunching the numbers, but humans have this creative intuition that we're not really good at quantifying yet. And I'm trying to see if I can pull a piece of that from horse racing and put it in the model. Right now, it's purely a data collection exercise. Um, I have done a little bit of, of, of integrating. Um, I tweeted out about a bet I made using something that Chris Army tweeted on his podcast, or sorry, said on his podcast. And my data was showing that he might be good in that particular spot. So I included it with a, uh, a sequence of two picks from my own model. Uh, so those are the kinds of things I'm trying to go with it long term. I'm really just trying to learn how the, the top humans do it, at least the top humans that talk about it publicly, <laughs> so I can pull their data and analyze it um, and see if I can infuse some of that in the prediction system. Now, I feel honored to be included within this project that you're working on because I mean, that's just really cool for me. So I greatly appreciate that. And that's been uh, very humbling to, to know that I'm a part of these rankings. And I know that you have, what is it, 16 people that you're looking at? Tracking 16. Um, some of them are not making enough picks. It might be changed. I might actually have to pull people off in the long term to keep it fair because they're not making enough picks at a rate that is kind of fair to the other <laughs> the other people. I thought they would have a good rate at the time, but 16 is currently what's in the in the database. Yeah. And I know that there's an element of anonymity within this. And obviously um, that's for people's protection and it's not a project that's intended to make anybody feel bad or make anybody sort of compete with each other in a way. This is something that I know that you're looking at purely to, to see what happens and from an analytical model, just to improve your own game. But is there anything within those rankings as far as the people that you've chosen that you've been really surprised by either how well they're doing or how poorly they're doing? Uh, that's interesting. So far, I mean, it's, it's early days. The sample is not big enough. I still see a lot. So one of the things I would say right off the bat is even though I think I have 1300 picks in there so far over 350 individual races. Um, one of the first questions I'm trying to understand is how, um, stable are the trends? So, you know, people's pretty, you know, everybody knows this, that does horse racing. I mean, you have good days and you have bad days, right? And over the long term, those things should even out. But I, it's unclear to me even at what rate those, those you know, at what level of picks would you have to make before kind of the long-term fluctuations of good days and bad days um, kind of falls away and you really see the true underlying ability. Um, so I guess the, the biggest surprise for me is just seeing how much fluctuation there is. And the fluctuation is driven largely by the difficulty of the cards that are available on that day. So for instance, from the first public release of the, the rankings to the second week, everybody's ranking dropped, including the benchmark morning line, because the tracks that were included were tough days, a lot of turf, Keeneland, you know, um, some, some harder days. I would imagine if you, you get to the season where there's much more consistent tracks, easier to handicap, you'll see those rankings fluctuate up. And over the course of a whole year, I expect to kind of see the, the long-term trends be revealed and not just these kind of intermediate, intermediate fluctuations. So that was definitely the one. And then the other thing would be, um, there's a wide distribution in the mean odds that public handicappers are picking. So some handicappers really go for prices. Some really tend to stick um, to the kind of lower priced horses. And what's interesting is that the, that doesn't seem at least early to relate to overall ability in terms of predictive power. So you see at the top spots, a very long shot picker and a very uh, kind of chalky picker. And they're both doing really well in terms of the power rating. And at the other end of the spectrum, you see the same. So. Early days, I'm not sure, you know, if there's a trend in that, but that's one of the questions I'm interested in knowing is, is the secret to success long shots, favorites, somewhere in between a mix? It's unclear currently. So that's, that's interesting. And I think in a way you're kind of seeking to answer a lot of um, questions that we all kind of have yet to answer, which is how to really be successful at this over time. And I think that's why there are so many people that do this publicly that can really formulate their analysis very clearly and have a lot of really good insight, 
but they just haven't reached that level of success, perhaps in their wagering to be able to play uh, professionally and just do that on the side. Or maybe it's not even that something that's not even an interest to them. They actually really just want to share with the general public what the analysis is, or maybe they just have more of the charisma and the natural ability to be able to communicate effectively to others on camera. And I think finding that balance of, are you actually good at this? Are you providing analysis that's original and actually informative? And are you communicating in a clear and effective way so that people are actually engaged and want to listen to you? I think that finding someone that has all of those elements is just like a, such a rarity and kind of almost impossible in a way. But to you from your limited time in the horse racing world so far, is there anyone that you really look up to or that uh, their analysis is something you're always paying attention to? Yeah, that, that's a great, that's, uh, um, I was thinking about that just on my own the other day. Who, you know, uh, I hear this asked in interviews a lot, like, who do, who do you kind of look to, who kind of taught you? I'm very new to this. Um, like I said, my my exposure really has not been in person. I, I don't know anybody in Little Rock, actually, <laughs> that I personally know that uh, plays the horse racing. Um, but the what I've gleaned from um, TV and podcasts, uh, the three people that I seem to gravitate towards are very, like, kind of three different wide personalities of people that I, I listen to because they, they come at the problem very differently. So on one end, um, the picks that Tommy Masses makes, he's kind of a legend, you know, big time professional gambler, has had a lot of success in really wild long shot bets. And what I find interesting about him is he can't seem to explain how he comes up with this. It's almost like pure instinct, intuition. All of the wisdom is just in, a, in, you know, in his subconscious almost. And he's so successful, but he can't explain his process. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, you get a guy like Tony Joe who's the, you know, the most successful quant out there, very analytical. I come from that world, so I really understand what he's saying, and it's good to know that he, uh, he is applying this knowledge in a way that's highly successful. Um, but, he, you know, when you listen to him on a podcast, and I'm very, I feel very much the same way. I don't know who the jockeys are. I don't follow that. <laughs> he really just analyzes the data. He doesn't know the trainers. He doesn't know the jockeys. You know, he might know a name here or there, but he doesn't do deep analysis of the individuals. And then in the middle is a guy like Chris Larmy, who's a, one of the co-hosts of the Sport of Kings co uh, podcast. He um, seems to blend. He understands the math. He doesn't necessarily do the quantitative part, but he, he believes in it. He's a speed figure guy, who believes in those kinds of numbers. He also is very good at explaining his process. When he's coming up with long shots, he really kind of works through it and kind of balances kind of the hunches with the math in a way that seems like a really good blend. Um, and so that's one of, you know, I, I uh, came across that podcast early on and that's one of the podcasts I really listened to religiously. And was one of the podcasts that kind of informed me thinking about doing the scalper track um, concept because they, I had already been keeping some numbers on from their podcast, uh, writing down um, what they were picking, and I was comparing it to my model and trying to see if, how if I could ever get there. And so uh, that was kind of the seed of the idea was the, the little database I was keeping on their podcast of forming kind of a wider net, casting a wider net with a lot of different people that make picks that I don't necessarily follow regularly. That's a uh, really cool because I feel like those are three people that I don't necessarily pay um, a ton of regular attention to, but I do know who you're referencing. So it's going to be somebody that uh, I definitely want to be checking out a little bit more since it's someone that you're following uh, very closely. Before we get into the late pick three on Wednesday at Keeneland, which is kind of the sequence that we're going to talk about, I just have to ask, are you keeping track of my colleague Ed as well? <laughs> uh <laughs> I, i'm not going to disclose so i only disclose carrots when somebody has a really good day okay uh, i'll say <laughs> something but i really don't want to get in the habit of tracking people it, you could if you really worked hard probably from random tweets i made glean reverse engineer who's who mm -hmm. uh, so i've made a public statement about chris marmy he's in the he's in the database you're in the database based on your fabulous uh i think it was your sunday picks yes or was that saturday sunday no it was sunday last week and you had mm -hmm amazing day um i'm not going to disclose anything else at least okay. 
<laughs> we'll keep it as a mystery. Um, all I know is that I'm beating him for top picks for Keelan and that's what matters to me. Okay. So. <laughs> you're, you're keeping your own internal database. So that's yes, absolutely. That's all right. Well, speaking of the data, we'll talk about race number six on Wednesday at Keeneland. This is an allowance optional claiming race. We have the Phillies and Mares and we're sprinting on the dirt going six for long. So I'll start with you. Where did your data kind of pinpoint um, as where to go within this eight horse field? So, so let me, uh, let me just briefly describe the process and I can kind of walk you through it. So my Equus model for every horse on every card um, tries to predict two numbers. Um, and I work in probability space, not odd space, but there's a kind of a direct relationship between the two spaces. So I pick, or so my model produces a prediction of what it thinks the public is going to put the price of the horse. And then it makes a separate prediction of what it actually thinks the horse's probability of winning is. And I compute the ratio of those two numbers. So it'd be basically be the win probability over the tote probability. And that is my estimate of value for the horse. And then from that, so when I'm handicapping for my numbers, kind of me just looking through the data, making picks, I actually have an automated wagering system, which I can also read off the picks for that later. But when I'm just looking at the numbers and coming up with my own picks, uh, I'm looking for positive EV horses that have um, a fairly high probability of winning. So I'm, not, I'm looking for kind of low variance positive EV picks. And so in the sixth race, my model really liked uh, the eight horse Capellia. So the morning line odds, it has five to one. Um, my model predicts it'll, it'll go up slightly at 5.1 to one at post time, but its fair odds seem to be lower about nine to two. And so I put that as my top use in the sixth race. That's Copelli, if I didn't say the name. All right, nice. That is actually my third pick. So I like <laughs> to hear it. Um, I'm against the favorite in here, which apparently uh, your data is telling you as well. And that's going to be the number three, Zana Larab, who's two to one on the morning line. Um, I actually went to the seven in here uh, as my top pick. I feel as though this trainer is better second off a long layoff, which even in this small sample size, he's um, 12. Uh, he has a, of 12. Of, he's 25 percent with a four dollar and 10 cent ROI of horses coming off second off of uh, over 180 days. So even though it's only been a couple of horses that he's done this with, I'm glad that this is a move that's successful for him because his numbers first off a layoff are just not that good. So I can argue that maybe this horse needed a race last time. I feel as though Magic Quest will get some early position um, to the outside, which has been very beneficial in these short stretch races. Posts one, two, and three are just not performing as well as the outside most posts going into a race like this that's only going around one turn at Keeneland. I think post one to date for this meet is still one for 60 plus. So far, um, obviously the one horse in here is a huge long shot, so I'm not interested in that one anyway, but it's a good little nugget of info going forward. Um, this horse's stakes place as a three-year-old. I think getting back to that three-year-old form really makes her a player in here. I like the six to one morning line. I think that people will gravitate towards Zayn al -Rab, ride the plan, and even the two bomb diggity. So those two outside horses seem like they're very interesting in a spot like this. Okay, I, uh, I can say that the model of, of all of the kind of uh, more favorite horses, the model does uh, give a pretty, it's, it's not, it's like almost a neutral EV for the, uh, the seven horse. It's at a 0.85. So that, I would consider that like a, a usable uh, favorite horse. It wouldn't damage the EV of the ticket too badly. That would be kind of how I'm, I look at it. Okay. Well, as long as it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's in that neutral range. So, that, you know, there's a confidence interval around these estimates. So, you know, if I say I try to take EV greater than 1.1, just because with the error of, of the modeling, it could be neutral or, or, or less. So um, there's confidence intervals about these numbers, anything I'm saying. <laughs> All right. Well, I think basically the message is toss the favorites, right? I, it, well, it depends. So my system really tends to like the favorites. Uh, when I, when I, so I built an automated wagering system that has a bunch, like kind of is balancing probability versus, versus EV. And it tends to be fairly chalky uh, in, in, in general, but when I'm looking at the numbers directly and I'm trying to figure out ways to encode this uh, in an automated way that um, that's very consistent over all different types of races. Uh, I tend to be less chalky when I'm, um, when I'm actually looking at the numbers directly. 
Well, you're also using your human brain too. So you're like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> and I try one of the, you know, the computer helps to limit the emotional um, part of the, the picking process. Makes sense. All right, well, well, we'll go to race number seven. And this is another allowance race. And this time we're on the turf course, three-year-olds and up are going a mile and an eighth. The number 11, Jero, I mean, this horse, the problem with him, even though he is very consistent, he just doesn't win. This horse has run 20 times. He's only won twice. One of those wins was a first place through a disqualification. And that was in July of 2021. Since then, he's had plenty of seconds. He's actually finished second seven times in his career. He's finished third four times. So even though he's been hitting the board, especially in his last four starts, in every single race of those this year, he's been under five to one and he just doesn't get the job done. So I'm very uh, bold on fading this horse just because I feel like he will still be a short price and he just doesn't find the winner's circle that often. Um, I do think Al's Rocket, the number seven, who is also a short price, has a legitimate chance in here. He finished behind a horse that went on to win the grade two Hill Prince the other day at Aqueduct. So I feel as though he's been facing some live horses. He's run fairly consistently. Um, I feel as though he might finally get a little bit of pace to chase getting away from those New York turf races. I think that the four Brazilian air will show some speed possibly the five and the nine as well and the four I just don't think he wants to go quite this far for a long shot I was looking at the number one kitten mischief who's 15 to one on the morning line this is one that's still fairly lightly raised and could possibly have some upside he is um somewhat improving since getting to the turf he was second off he's going second off a layoff in here um he was turf meant on debut too he was actually rained off the turf to win that race on the dirt and then kind of tried the uh Tampa Bay route to the road to the Kentucky Derby unsuccessful in there then takes a little bit of a break and possibly with that advantageous rail positioning could outrun his odds a little bit in this spot. So I actually have that horse labeled as a value play, like okay. uh, number one kitten mischief. Uh, morning line is 15. My model says that'll go down to 14.3 to one at post time, but the fair odds are nine to one. So that's a 1.53. It's a big value play. Uh, it's a little bit of a long shot compared to another play I like. So my top pick for the seventh race is the three horse forwardly. Morning line is eight to one. My model says that'll go down to six to one, but it's fair odds are a little higher than nine to two. So I consider my top use, uh, but I would consider including actually the one. Uh, if I was looking to kind of juice up the total payout of the, the ticket, I think there's value there um, as well. What does the system think about Jero the 11? Uh, it's the worst uh, favorite, <laughs> I think, of the day. Even it's a point wow. seven one value, so it's three to one morning line. It's going to get bet down to five to two, and it ha my model says four four point two is the fair odds. So it's you know it's a, it's a it's a poor play. <laughs> so when you see something like that, would you just immediately toss a horse with um, that kind of notation? That's a great question. So the answer is uh, that horse probably. Um, but I, just because a horse has uh, a negative EV doesn't mean I would automatically toss it. So for when we're doing a horizontal wager, so in a horizontal wager, what really matters is that the total product of the expected values of all the individual bets in your sequence is greater than one. And so you can use a favorite that has maybe a negative EV to link together um, some, some po positive EV horses if it can contribute to an overall like lower variance of the payout. So when you're trying to balance payouts, you're trying to get scores that are positive EV, but you also want to hit fairly regularly. You don't want to have to wait months and months betting super long shots in a sequence. It'll pay out eventually and make a ton of money, but uh, to have some cash flow, you, <laughs> you want to kind of be hitting at a, you know, a kind of a predictably regular basis. So I would use a horse like that occasionally um, to link together, especially if it had a really high probability of winning, um, to link together some some uh, parts of the sequence. So that's that is an angle you can use. Uh, every leg of the sequence does not have to be positive EV. I think that's kind of what a lot of people try to do when they're structuring their tickets anyway, is if you're leaning on a shorter price somewhere, you have to have stronger opinions and prices somewhere else within the sequence to make sure that it pays well enough that it's worth your time. So I love that you already have something kind of built in that's you're already thinking about that because that's such an important part of ticket structuring. That's it's and when I actually do the automated wagering system, it's kind of uh, it's building in 
kind of upper bounds and lower bounds of the payout of the ticket and giving kind of telemetry to decide whether or not I'm going to bet would be what's the hit probability. And I can talk through the details of the, the alternative system that I, that I have. It makes different picks than the ones I would be making now, um, but it kind of bounds the risk and kind of it gives you information whether or not to kind of play or don't play based on that risk. Um, and it's all just basically an expected value number. So yeah, it's, it, there's a human intuition, but the kind of numbers make it very concrete how to make these plays and it takes the guessing work out of it. Hmm, that's cool. If so, they're accurate. So that's the game right. is whether or not the numbers are right. <laughs> there's, um, there's something that I've used a couple of times. Um, and we obviously also sell through horse racing nation. It's called charting horse value. I don't know if you've checked it out at all, but have you, I follow him regularly on Twitter. So I, I know, okay. you know, his system so you know Jeff. System. All right, great. Well, Jeff is great. And he has a really cool, um, tool that he's developed as well. And he'll kind of rank those races, either get the zero a one or a two, and basically letting, you know, is this a really good race to play? Is it one that you maybe want to pass? So I also love that you have something that's like a play or don't play as well. Okay. I do have something. It's not, I don't have it formally up here, but I actually, um, so I, I train my model in a large set of data, about 200,000 uh, individual horse efforts so far, but I actually hold out another smaller data set. We call it a machine learning validation set. And what I do from that set is, is a set that was not used to train the model. I predict racing outcomes in that, um, in that data set to give me an idea of how well the model is doing in different types of surfaces and you know racing classes and types. And so I actually use that information to kind of build in additional, you know, are the, like, what is my confidence in the numbers for this race? And they are definitely lower. I can make that public. Like the, the model definitely strong turf races as dirt and synth races. And I've actually, I have a very specific number of what that performance is internally to kind of build into the go, no, go, no, go decision, whether or not to bet. Wow. It's just like, it's all a little bit above me, but it's so interesting that you're already like thinking of all these ideas already, because I think too, like so many people that are just getting into the game, they don't think about all of these angles right away. So, I mean, the, the wide variety of the variables that are already being considered and that you're already wanting to make sure that you have some sort of answer for, or at least are factoring into your handicapping analysis and making sure that the data is processed with these ideas in mind is just like very sophisticated as well. So I feel like it's only a matter of time before you're having a ton of success with this model going forwards. I, I hope so. Yeah. And one of the other, th one of my other objectives is a really, you know, a lot of computer people don't talk about their models publicly it's kind of like a secret but i really I come from a school where it's i really feel like we want to build up a community of people talking more more technical about horse racing kind of have a community and public discussion about these kinds of issues i think it would it would help everybody not just the computer people but the uh, the paper and pencil handicappers as well and I think it also opens up um, this game in general to a wider audience too, because there might be people that want to approach it from that way. There's there's just so many different ways that you can look at horse racing and handicapping, and it doesn't really even matter what your approach is. You can all come up with different answers. You can all have some level of success or some level of failure at the game as well. There's just so many different ways to look at the same information and sort of process it. And I think that's why it's such a cool uh, sport in general for everybody, because you can get all those sorts of different ways of thinking going into the same thing. And, and kind of my favorite part about horse racing is you get immediate feedback on whether or not you're doing a good job. <laughs> yes. And that, what I love about it too, is that that feedback is not from another person. Correct. It's, it's an objective feedback. You know? Yes. <laughs> it's kind of like when people are saying, oh, like you didn't have a good day today. And I'm like, I know I watched the races. Like I'm <laughs> fully aware of the results and what happened. And I think that that's another really good original thing about it to um, be able to evaluate yourself of the results happened. You either won or you lost or your horse had a trip or they didn't. And sort of your perspective and what you learn from that going forwards too. Um, but just to have that sort of middle ground of like, these are the results of the race and it's not somebody else's opinion telling you otherwise. Yeah. And, you know, on the flip side of that is, um, you know, you can make very, very good bets and lose. And so that's the other part of the game. I think it's kind of, you know, horse racing is a microcosm of life is that if you know what you're doing and you just stick to the plan, you will have success in the long term if what you're doing is correct. Even on a day where you just get kicked in the teeth when you made every play mm -hmm. correct. And, you know, 
these are stochastic systems, so there's a lot of random chance. <laughs> and the best the best laid plans might not survive a, a bad day, but they also can use like your last Sunday you had just an amazing. You went like six for nine, or there was a scratch of maybe six for eight or something like that. It was. Yeah. It was really, those are good days. I hope you cashed. Yeah. Yes, it was a good day. Um, I. And I've had bad days since and I'll have great days again. And that's kind of one of the great things about the game is that, um, you know, you're, you're not defined by your most recent day, no matter how good or bad it, it was. No. And we'll quickly just get into the last race on the card on Wednesday. And I'll let you go first of what, uh, what the data tells you for which horses uh, are, are mm -hmm. signaling out to you in here. Cause this is a tough race. Yeah. So, sorry, I'll say it. So this is, I don't normally look at these things, but so this is a maiden claiming race, seven furlongs on the dirt. Uh, it's open with uh, three and up. Okay, so my model, uh, my strong use on this was the 11 horse, Apollo Rising. So the morning line on this horse is uh, seven to two. My model says that that will be the, the off price for this horse, seven to two. And it's you're going to get slightly better fair odds. There's 3.1 to 1 is the use, and that's an overall value of 1.09. Excuse me. Um, and just I'm, this model is also fading master game, so um, at a 0.73 value. Um, yeah, I mean, the 11, I think. I I feel like that one is the the horse that you go to as the other one if you're trying to beat master game because this one has only raced once and has you know plenty of room for improvement in a field like this as well and i mean that 68 buyer first time out certainly makes this horse a player here um, with master game it seems like something must have gone amiss because this horse debuted as a two-year-old in the todd pletcher barn and actually ran very well um and then is off for a very long time comes back with a new trainer and has faced elite power two times, which is a horse that has gone on to win the grade two Bosberg stakes and is probably a future multiple graded stakes winner. So facing decent horses, but then is off for a little bit of more time then comes back on the turf and now is in for the tag for the first time, dropping down to that $40,000 level and is getting the blinkers on, does come in with a decent bullet work. But this horse is going to be, I mean, a very logical horse to use for a lot of people this horse is likely going to take a significant amount of money maybe this horse goes to the lead and is just better than these horses but this horse is one that's very tough to trust because it seems as though this one was sort of very well intentioned from the beginning um, especially with that sale price there's a little bit of pedigree and being in a top trainer's barn and then moving out of there I mean this is kind of the, the favorite that you want to try to beat um, the unfortunate thing is that the rest of this field, once you get outside of the 11, is just very tough to trust in general. And I don't really think too much of this first time starter either, which is maybe an angle that you'd want to gravitate towards when you just don't really love anybody else is to take a horse that you don't know as much about. Um, but there's no one else in here that I can really make a strong case for with the one horse that one post position is just not doing well in these one turn dirt races. And this horse has had a couple of chances as well. Um, maybe make a case for the number six horse who has run only one time, who's getting the blinkers on, maybe make a case for the seven trying the dirt for the first time, but I don't really love that surface for a progeny of this sire slumber. So I feel like the 11 is the way to go in a race like this. We agree. That's great. Um, I do have a, so the, uh, the six horse would be my second choice. It's okay. um, 15 morning line. It's going to go up to 16. It's projected to go up to 16.1 fair odds is 13.5. So you're getting some value there, but at quite a bit higher odds, I would, so that kind of wouldn't made me land on the 11 is it's really a, it's a higher probability horse that has a pretty decent value. Um, and the rest, it's the the models really not too favorable on. So <laughs> the rest are very <laughs> tough to like for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, glad we agree on the finale. And before I let you go, I had just have one last question. Mm -hmm. Who do you like so far for the Breeders' Cup Classic, if anyone? Yeah. So I'm a I'm on the flight line train. That horse. Good. <laughs> when I run those, uh, when I run the PPs through the model, it just kind of spikes at the. The max. <laughs> it's uh, cool. it, it's hard to come up with that horse that you know can beat that horse on paper. But you know, there's other factors. But from the numbers, that horse is really unbeatable. And we'll you know we'll see what the tote board looks like. What is a price that you think would be fair to take on a horse like Flightline? Yeah, that's uh, 
I'd have to have the, yeah, I'd have to have the most recent up PPs with all the other horses, mm -hmm. but uh, what would I take? I, you could probably take one to nine. I, I think you could yeah. take one to nine and still make money. I really feel like the, the models are going to like that horse, you know, yeah. it's something it's, it's going to be the highest probability I've seen in the database. I'm sure. Once it comes out. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, from everything we've seen so far, I feel like as long as he uh, makes it into the starting gate and keeps the rider aboard, then yeah. he's going to be very tough to get past. So I'm just excited to see him run. Um, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. And I guarantee this will not be your last appearance on camera and horse racing. I feel as though a lot of people are very interested in your methods and your approach and hearing from you about the data that you're working with and being able to track, because I think it's something that, while not necessarily a hundred percent unique, the way that you describe it and your publicity with it is definitely very original and something that I feel like a lot of us are more interested in learning about. So thank you for taking the time to chat with me. I appreciate it. Thank you. This is really great. It was a great opportunity.